Man, uh, some good worship this morning, amen? amen. Uh, praise God. Yeah, um, hey, if you have your Bible, open it up to 2 Timothy chapter 2, page numbers should be on screen. If you're in the blue Bibles uh, inside uh, the, the seats there, uh, down below there should be one there, grab that. If you don't have a Bible with you, uh, we're on page 964 there. Uh, but uh, we're in 2 Timothy chapter 2. This is week 3 of a series we're calling Seek Ye First. And uh, this series is really designed to help Christians think about how we can live and seek first God's kingdom in a polarizing political climate like America that would desire us to truly... Uh, give ourselves over to a different kind of kingdom altogether. And uh, so in week one, we talked about this idea of how uh, we are called as followers of Jesus to seek first his kingdom. And uh, although we can put our focus and worry about what's getting ready to happen, what's going to happen in November, what's going to happen in the next couple of weeks, what's going to happen in the next month or two, like we can, we can start to worry about what's going to happen years from now if someone is elected, or we can choose to wake up every day and seek first the kingdom and his righteousness. We can wake up today and we can seek first letting him lead us he is our king he is our shepherd we'll let him lead us we'll just follow him today and we'll seek his righteousness to live in right relationship with him and with his image bearers with other people that's his righteousness so we can do that we can control that we can't really control a lot else he's got control of all that other stuff so let's just not worry and let's just seek first his kingdom knowing that he sees it all and is in control of it all and is at work in it all. And then last week we talked about the idea of how we as Christians are called in a, in a, in a world like we live in, in a culture like we live in now, to really put some emphasis and focus on making sure that we pass down the gospel to the next generation. And the only way in which we'll be able to truly do that is if our faith in and of itself is authentic. If, 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 if we are, are willing to stand up in the face of an oppressive and sometimes even hostile culture, um, will this next generation see something in us that they will then be able to live out in themselves and in their own time? But here's the other thing, is no matter how strongly convicted we are, about the gospel and the truth of Jesus Christ. We must always, always hold our conviction lightly and hold tightly to compassion. We must always let our compassion speak louder than our conviction when trying to share the gospel because, because that is um, ultimately uh, a better way to go about it. But... This week, we're going to transition just slightly. There's going to be some overlap, but, but we're going to transition just slightly. Uh, any of you guys ever been in any heated debates? I can tell by the chuckle that you have, right? Like, we've all probably know what it's like to get into some of these, what I would like to say, persuasive conversations, where we're trying to get someone to, to reason with us, to come over to our side, or, 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 or see things the way that we want, to, uh, want them to see them, or, or we've had other people trying to do that to us, right? We've had other people who are trying to pull us to their side, and we've gotten into these persuasive conversations. I want to just remind us again, it, it, just like last week when we talk about the gospel, these types of conversations, we need to always make sure that our compassion is louder than our conviction. All right? But these conversations, uh, they, they often, they turn into heated debates. They tend to often do more harm than good. They tend to alienate people and make really complex things seem really simple when they're not. And we offer very unthoughtful solutions that just tend to fit our paradigm or the things that we have stuck in our head. Um, and so many of these conversations are difficult to actually get through and maintain relationship with the other person. And that is so, so dangerous. And it's really dangerous, especially when a lot of these conversations in America happen around the idea of politics or policy. And so today, um, I just, 
I just want to lean into that a little bit, right? Because I can tell already you're thinking about the last conversation you had with someone. Uh, I can see by the steam coming out of your ears, right? Uh, and and, I, and, and you're, you're thinking about, you know, all of the arguments that you had with that person on Facebook last night. Even though you didn't say anything, it was all here, right? And you, you saw the post, and so it, you, you started going after them. I want to just, just turn our attention to 2 Timothy because I think there's something there that's really rich and beautiful and profound for all of us to take heart. And it's also, it's just very simply stated. And I love it when the Bible is just simply stated because it, it doesn't overcomplicate things. It's not like, oh, I got to know the Greek in order to understand what this means, right? Like I could just, I could just read it and I, I kind of get it. So 2 Timothy, we're going to start in verse 20. Uh, of chapter 2. All right, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 20. says, In a large house there are articles not only of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay. Some are for special purposes and some for common use. Those who cleanse themselves from the latter will be instruments for special purposes, made holy useful to the master and prepared to do any good work. Flee the evil desires of youth and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Don't have anything to do with foolish and stupid arguments, because you know they produce quarrels. And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but must be kind to everyone. Able to teach, not resentful. Opponents must be gently instructed in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to the knowledge of the truth, and that they will come to their senses and escape from the trap of the devil who has taken them captive to do his will. So, <clears throat> let me start by talking about this idea that Paul begins this section with where he says, you know, there are ornaments in a house uh, of gold and silver and wood and clay, and some have special purposes and some have common purposes. Um, I, I want you to think about the, uh, let, let's, let's think about a spoon and a shovel, okay? Spoon and a shovel. Now, a spoon, uh, you want a spoon to be clean, Right? Uh, because if a spoon is clean, you can use it to eat with, um, you don't want to eat with a dirty spoon. Uh, a shovel is meant to get into the dirt and pick things up, and, and then it served its purpose. It, and what, what Paul is getting at is that there are certain things that are set apart, um, but they must maintain their cleanliness in order to actually serve their purpose. And then there are other instruments that, like, it doesn't really matter um, if they're clean or not because they serve their purpose because they're just common useful tools okay um, now this idea that Paul's trying to help uh, Timothy understand is one of holiness okay in the temple there were holy instruments holy utensils now I want you to think about this because a lot of times we think of holiness as like a moral descriptor like you're holy when you're good when you dress a certain way, when you don't say this word or that word or whatever, right? Like, like that's kind of the way we think of holiness. That holiness is when you're a good person, uh, that, that's holiness. But if a utensil in the temple can be holy, that isn't really what the Bible's talking about when it's saying holy, is it? Because a utensil can't be good or bad, can it? It can just serve a purpose. That's what holiness in the scripture is really drawing us toward, is that certain things are, that, that are holy have been set apart for a purpose. And he's trying to help Timothy see that you and I and we as, as people who have been bought by the blood of Jesus Christ, because Jesus died on the cross for our sins, and he washed us clean from our sins by his broken body and shed blood, that you and I have now been made holy. That we've been set apart for a purpose. And so we must maintain this purpose. We must not start to live and use our lives like common instruments. 
but we must maintain this sense of, well, I've been set apart for a purpose. And then Paul says, okay, this is how you do that. This is how you stay set apart for God's purpose is you flee. In other words, run and run fast, <laughs> right? You flee from these evil desires that you have. Um, and and th these, could be, these could be desires of your flesh to gratify your flesh. This could be sexual immorality. This could be drunkenness. This could be debauchery. Any so sort of form of fleshly like desire. Like I'm chasing after something because like, oh, it just feels good even though it's not good. It's not what holy people are meant to do or be engaged in. And so he's saying flee from all of that stuff. That was stuff that you did when you were young. That was stuff you did in your youth when you didn't understand the gospel, when you didn't understand that you had been bought by the blood of Jesus and that you were washed clean. And then he says something else. He says, but also I want you to pay attention to the fact that people who, who understand their salvation, people who are trying to follow God with a pure heart, they're focused, they're focused on righteousness and faith and love and peace. This is what their focus is on. This is what they're chasing after. So since you're chasing after those things, don't get involved in any stupid arguments. <laughs> that's pretty simple, right? Like, I mean, I don't. I, I think that, that's that's one of the most like. If you were to ask me, one of the most applicable verses for Christians today, right? We can't go like, oh, well, this was a thing for the first century church. You know, we don't have to worry about. No, like, don't get involved. Don't have anything to do with foolish and stupid arguments because you know they produce quarrels. Notice he doesn't say, don't get involved in these things because no one's going to listen to you anyway and change their mind. He doesn't say, don't get involved in these things because, you know, it's, it's going to, you know, it's going to mean that you are condemned or that you are sinning or any of those other kinds of things. He says, because it causes quarrels. It causes fights. It causes division. It causes you to, to not be unified with the person that you're arguing with. That's not good. That's what Paul's saying. Don't do it because it's not good for you to be separated or experiencing disunity with this person. Now, I do want to make sure that you understand. Paul is writing to Timothy, who's a young pastor, okay? And so it's very, it's very, very uh, likely that this direction for Timothy has to do with even some theological issues that like don't even don't don't get don't get into arguments with people about God's word or about the scriptures or about following God Jesus or anything else like that like like the I'm a young pastor I like to think I am at least you know maybe some of you guys I'm you know, um <laughs> But I can tell you, I can tell you that when I was younger, somebody like I went, I went to, I went to Bible college, you know, paid a lot of money for that degree, uh, and and so when when I would get up and I would teach a teach a message, um, <laughs> and someone would come up to me and go, you know. I don't know if that's accurate or if that's really what it means or they wanted to like argue with me about it. I'm like, bro, have y'all gone to, you gone to Bible college? <laughs> you know, have you, do you, uh, what do you do eight hours a day? What do you, you know, like, are you, are you reading their Bible eight hours a day? Um, I'm not either, just so you guys know. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> but, but here's the thing, like, 
it can be really like easy to go, well, who are you to tell me? I like, are you kidding? Like, this is my job, right? And so it would be very easy for a young pastor trying to prove themselves and make sure that no one looks down on them because they're young, right? Like Paul's already encouraged Timothy, uh, that, they would, that they would get into these arguments about theology or about the Bible or about God's Word. But, but I also think it applies to us because we're all to be servants of Jesus. I'm not the only servant in the room. We're all servants of Christ Jesus. And so all of us as servants of Christ Jesus need to pay attention to the fact that whenever we get into arguments and disputes that are pointless, they cause quarrels and they cause fights, whether about theology or about politics or whatever, education, whatever it is that you want to make the issue. And oftentimes what's going to happen is, is you're going to, you're going to cause a, a, a big rift and a big divide with a relationship that you're meant to cultivate and build up in love. And, and so when he says you know, this, he says, because Lord's servants must not be quarrelsome. You shouldn't want to get in fights with people. You shouldn't want to try and prove a point with people. Don't be quarrelsome. But listen. But you must be kind. Can I get an amen to just like, can we be kind people? You know, like what happened to just like being kind to someone? Like, just be kind. Able to teach. Able to say, hey, this is what I believe and why I believe that. But in a kind way, not resentful. And when we get into, like, quarrelsome arguments and things like that, don't we, like, harbor some resentment? You know? Like... The next time you see that person, you're just still like, oh, got to, you know, those are, those are the uh, EGR people. You guys know EGR, extra grace required. Um, <laughs> like, like, oh, there they are again. You know what I mean? It's like, let's just, let's not, like these quarrels, these fights, what they do is they build resentment. They don't help us do away with it. And we aren't meant to hold on to those things. We aren't meant as servants of Jesus to, to be and live and walk with resentment in our hearts toward other, other people who bear the image of our God. But here's what I, here's what I love most about this passage. In verse 25... Paul says, opponents, they must be gently instructed. They must be gently instructed in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to the knowledge of truth. I think sometimes the problem that we face as Christians and as followers of Jesus is we keep trying to get people to change their mind and turn around. That's what repentance means. We keep trying to get people to turn around, and we forget that's not our job. God does that. God is the initiator of repentance. God does the work of calling someone to turn around. You and I can't do that. We can just come alongside of God in the work that he's already doing. Now, here's the, here's the crazy thing about that is when we actually let God be God and we just help him, that's what we're designed to do. That's what you and I are created for in the very beginning. 
We were meant to be co-rulers and, 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 and rule alongside of him to help him as, as, and bring his way to this earth as it is in heaven. That's our job. So when we just get into our space of where like, oh, I'm just going to be gentle and instructive gently, I'm going to help God do what he's doing. But if they don't turn, that doesn't mean it, that it doesn't change my identity. It doesn't change who I am. It doesn't change my job. I don't have to hold resentment toward that person if they don't turn. I can just keep praying, God, I just, I want to see this person turn. I want to see this person turn around and repent. Like, that has to be the motive. We can't go into any situation, the motive trying to be, hey, I'm going to try and prove a point because I'm right. When we go into situations trying to prove a point or trying to say, well, this is the way it is because it's the right way. If you get into an argument with someone and you catch yourself in that argument and you're just trying to prove a point because you feel like you're right, just stop. Just stop the argument and be like, hey, sorry, my motive is off. My motive is off. Your motive always has to start with the good of the other person Hoping that they might turn. Hoping that God might do something in them to cause them to turn. That's where the motivation has to be. And then you just join him in his work. You do what you can to gently hold on to the truth, but like proclaim it, but do it gently and lovingly and kindly with peace in your heart. And he says, and they will come to their senses and will escape from the trap of the devil who has taken them captive to do his will. You know, um, you know what I think is really interesting is I, I'm not an overly, I, I've said this in the series, I'm not an overly political person, but I, I find it very funny um, so sorry, I don't want to offend anybody, and I'm trying not to make fun of anyone uh, and your position. But I find it very funny that, like, Republicans will look at Democrats with the thought process of, like, oh, you know what? They really need to know the truth because they're inside of the devil's lies. And then Democrats will look at the Republicans and be like, oh, they are just, they're just being used by the devil. Can I just say, when you have that mindset, maybe you are being used by the devil? That, like, maybe you've been, ca are captive to his schemes and his ways? Because you're, you're just casting judgment in every direction. And forgetting about your own responsibility to just love and follow Jesus. I can remember, um, I'll tell you guys a story because it's funny. Um, I can remember coming home from college. And um, <clears throat> this is the second election that I was able to vote in. Um, and I came home, my grandpa and my grandma were at my, my dad's house, and we were visiting with them. I'll never forget, we were having a conversation, a pointless argument, some might say. And, um, <laughs> and I can remember my, uh, <laughs> my grandma and grandpa going, how much are you paying for those liberals to teach you this? tell you what <laughs> you can't fix stupid <laughs> and it's okay all of our families are stupid that's not just mine 
Um, here, here's the deal. Here's the deal. I just, we, we have to do a better job as, as followers of Jesus to understand that, man, the person to your right and to your left, the person that, that you see that represents in your mind evil or in your mind everything that's wrong with the world is not your enemy. And if you don't see that, if you start to turn them into your enemy, you are becoming a tool of the enemy instead of a creative tool for God's kingdom and his ways, which is what you're really created for. And so we must just be very, very careful about this. Very, very careful about this. And if we get into these arguments, it's going to be really, really hard to keep that mindset. To keep that mindset. I want to I wanna close uh, by, by trying something a little bit different than we've ever done here before. Okay, so I understand some of you are very comfortable when things don't change. The problem with that is, is I'm a pastor who loves to change things as much as possible. Uh, and so uh, it, is, it, it is a constant conversation uh, in our elders meetings of, Derek, do you want to make this change just because you think like change is fun right now? Uh, uh, so, uh, so anyway, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to challenge you to do something a little bit different. I'm going to invite you to stand. Everybody stand up in your seat right now where you're at. Okay. Um, and, um, and, and here's, here's what I'm going to ask you to do. Okay. Here's what I'm going to ask you to do. Um, I'm going to ask this group of people, I'm going to ask you to turn and face that group of people right there because they're already facing you. Okay? All right. And I'm going to ask this group of people to turn and face this group of people right here. Okay? Now, I want you to try to do something. I want you to try and lock eyes with someone uh, that, yeah, I, we're going <laughs> to lock eyes and, and dream deeply. Uh, about our future together. Um, no, I want, you, I want you to lock eyes with someone that you would deem as the most different from you. Think about the person who might be most different from you. Maybe you're a little bit younger and so you find someone a little bit older. Maybe you're, maybe you're, maybe you're black and so you find someone who's white. Maybe you're white and so you find someone who's Latino. Maybe you are a male and so you, you lock eyes with a female in good and loving Christian uh, way. Uh, <laughs> but, but you lock eyes and I, want, and I want to just read something over you. And I just want you to listen to these words as you look into the face of this other person. But God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it, so that there should be no division in the body but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. And if one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all the mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but I do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. 
It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. You may take your seats. Thank you for doing that very uncomfortable thing. <laughs> but we are the body of Christ. We are a beautiful mosaic of differences, of age and gender and race and nationality, knit together by the blood of Jesus. May we know that it is our job it is our job to love one another. We do not get to be a part of this community or this body because of our giftedness. And our giftedness is not the most important thing we can offer to this body, but it is love. It is not our job to try and persuade or move someone to our side to help them understand our side of the issues or our side of the argument. It is our job to love, to be kind, to be gentle, and to hope, to hope that through our love and our compassion and us holding tightly to the truth, that where we fail and where one of our brothers and sisters fail, that, that we might be led by God into repentance. That should be our hope for each person. But it, kindness is what leads to repentance. Grace and mercy and love when it's undeserved when it's unmerited that leads to repentance may we join God in his work that we might all see where we've fallen short and turn around and try and follow Jesus and try and help our brothers and sisters do the same. May we be patient and kind. May we not be proud or boastful. May we not be self-seeking. May we keep no record of wrong. May we persevere, trust, have hope that love will never fail. Let's pray. God, we thank you. Thank you for this morning. We thank you that you love us. Thank you that you save us when we don't deserve it. Thank you that you give us an opportunity to remember your love for us, your sacrifice for us, your broken body and your shed blood bring us together and give us hope and give us a love for one another despite our differences God may you help us to not desire to prove points may you let us be servants who cling to what is good and what is right. Let us not be quarrelsome. 
Let us not be a part of causing division. Even when we need to correct or instruct, may we do it gently with love in mind. God, forgive us for when we fail to do this. Forgive us for when we look at your other image bearers as something less because of their difference. Rid us of that evil in our heart. We pray this in Jesus' name.